Ian, Alan and Maureen for inviting me to, to give this talk this evening, looking at uh, some of my PhD research. So we're going to be looking at evidence-based practices for autism in Irish primary schools. Um, so this uh, piece of research forms um, my overall PhD project, which is titled Bridging the Gap, Understanding Irish Teachers' Implementation of Evidence-Based Practices um, for Autism. This is an Irish Research Council funded uh, PhD project. And I am being supervised by Dr. Jennifer McMahon from the Teaching for Inclusion Lab in the Department of Psychology UL. Uh, by Dr. Jennifer Holloway from NUI Galway and also by Professor Stephen Gallagher from the Department of Psychology also in UL. So just a little bit of an overview of what we're going to cover um, tonight. So first of all, I'm just going to have a look at uh, relevant educational policy for students with autism and autism education in general in Ireland. Um, I'll then run you through some of the research outlining evidence-based practices for autism. Um, I'll then discuss some issues in implementing evidence-based practices in schools in particular, and then I'll walk you through some of uh, the findings of our research and implications for practice and further research as well. So I suppose just a bit of um, a background to my interest in researching this area. Um, it primarily arose from my own experiences working as a behaviour analyst in Ireland. So I completed my master's in ABA in 2015 um, and I received accredi accreditation as a BCBA in 2018. And I suppose once I left the master's, I was out in the community working um, with families and um, working in schools and things like that. And I also completed um, an assistant psychologist post uh, with the HSE Disability Services. Um, and, you know, as any of us um, working in ABA know, we are ethically bound to recommend scientifically based treatment. Um, and, you know, I suppose when I was going into schools and when I was working um, in the community and, and, and things like that, I was identifying that, you know, when I was going into schools, um, teachers weren't necessarily aware of some of the evidence based practices I was recommending for, for use with the students. And, you know, they appear to kind of have um, a lack of knowledge of evidence based practices for autism in general. You know, as well as that, there's a large number of us in Ireland working with people with autism and many of us provide consultation to educational services and schools. So, you know, hopefully, um, by you know outlining my research tonight you might get a little bit more information as to what this looks like um, in Ireland. So looking at um, the autism educational policy in Ireland then, um, the department's policy is that students with special educational needs, also including autism, be included in mainstream schools unless this is not in their best interests. So what this roughly means is that the first port of call for students with autism in Ireland is inclusion in mainstream classrooms, um, then followed by autism special classes, cl special classes or autism units, and then special schools. Um, under, I suppose, guidelines provided by the Department of Education, the responsibility for teaching children with special educational needs um, falls on mainstream class teachers. Within, um, so any students with SEN that are included in uh, mainstream classes, the responsibility for their education falls to the mainstream class teacher. And the department also recommends that teachers should use um, evidence-informed evidence interventions or should be mindful of using them. The underlying philosophies and kind of principles in the education system in Ireland are constructivism. So this is whereby the child is supported to construct their own learning experience. So the teacher um, ideally supports the child in constructing their own um, ideas about the world. Um, with autism interventions in particular, um, eclecticism appears to be favoured in Ireland. Um, this is where, you know, no one intervention or approach for autism is favoured and teachers should have autonomy, autonomy and should be free to choose interventions based on the child's needs or and from a variety of theoretical backgrounds. So any of you interested in looking at that a little bit further, I'd really recommend this uh, paper by Carola Dillenberger uh, that was published in 2011. And um, I suppose eclecticism is very popular in Europe. Um, so it seems to be kind of widespread um, across Europe. And that would be in contrast with, you know, the United States. Um, so the United States has policy, um, underlying policy, which is mandated. Um, so it's legislated for that teachers have to use scientifically based uh, practices with their students with autism. Um, and many of these are based on the underlying principles of ABA, so behavior analysis. Um, and looking at eclecticism as well, in comparison with uh, behavioral approaches um, or you know, programs that are derived from behavior analysis, there isn't any scientific evidence to back uh, this type of an approach. So there isn't any scientific evidence to back eclecticism as, um, 
and it has also been found to be inferior to programs that are derived from behavior analysis as well. So just examining some of the, I suppose, policy guidelines uh, that were developed for, for autism in particular. In 2016, the National Council for Special Education in Ireland published its policy advice paper. So this was um, a review of autism education that they undertook um, to provide policy guidance to the, to the Department of Education in relation to educating students with autism. So there were two kind of main research papers that informed this uh, policy advice paper. The first of those was an evaluation of autism um, education provision, and the second was a systematic literature review of um, interventions for educating people with autism spectrum disorder as well. So I'll just delve a little bit further into those um, in a minute, but looking at the kind of overall findings with regards to autism prevalence and autism placement, um, they found in their, their policy advice paper when reviewing um, the, the education system in Ireland that there was about a prevalence rate of 1.55% of students with autism um, in schools in Ireland. And, you know, this meant that there was, I suppose this, these figures are, are from 2015, but that there were around 14,000 students with autism being educated in Ireland at that time. Um, in line with the department's, I suppose, inclusive education policies, we can see very clearly uh, the influence of this because 63% of students with autism were educated in mainstream classrooms, 23% were educated in autism special classes or units, and 14% were educated in special schools. So what we can kind of see here from looking at this, you know, is that 86% um, of students with autism are now educated either in a mainstream classroom or in an autism uh, unit attached to a mainstream classroom. So again, you know, uh, that, that I suppose key area there of you know how prepared are mainstream teachers um, to educate these students you know how are they supported to educate these students um, was were kind of the questions that were arising from this um, when I was looking at it. So looking at the evaluation of um, autism provision then so the aim of this paper was to evaluate state funded provision for students with autism. Now it was conducted across um, a number of different age groups so it was conducted across um, our preschool age, school age and post-primary age and also they evaluated the July provision program and home tuition programs as well um, but I suppose I was just interested in the primary school setting because that's where my research was focused uh, so that's just what I'm going to report on this evening but the, what the researchers um, in this evaluation of education provision did was they conducted interviews with parents, teachers, principals, um, and some of the students, and they also conducted uh, direct observations in the classrooms as well. So observations uh, were rated by two independent raters. So there was the principal investigator uh, rated first, and then somebody came along to rate for agreement. And based on the agreement between their, um, between their observations, uh, items were scored using terms like never, almost never occurred, or al always or al almost always occurred. Um, and, you know, provision was unacceptable to, to excellent. So some of the, so just as well to highlight with the primary schools um, in particular, there was um, the, the primary school evaluation occurred across B sites and D sites. So the B sites were students with autism included in mainstream classes in primary schools. And these observations and evaluations occurred across three primary schools educating for children with autism. As well as that, um, they evaluated special classes in two primary schools um, and three ASD specific classes um, as well. So I suppose what we can kind of see here is that it, it is quite a small um, sample size, particularly, you know, it, it taking that there was only five primary schools and um, four children with autism in that mainstream class in particular, mainstream class group in particular, sorry. Um, so some of the findings then from, from this evaluation were that the knowledge of staff in primary schools of ASD specific teaching methodologies varied, where there was a special class um, in the school, very good to excellent levels of relevant knowledge, understanding and skills were evident, um, but where, so in the only school, so site B3 was the only school where there was no autism unit attached. Um, so they found that the principal would say that it is a concern for all of us that we might need more in service, so more training. Um, as well as that, the, the evaluation identified that there was limited availability of external professionals to support teachers, and this was a barrier to implementing a team approach in, in all sites. 
So I suppose there was a few questions that arose from, from looking at this evaluation. Um, and in particular, I suppose one of the limitations of it would be the, the very small sample size. So, you know, it was only reflective of three mainstream classes, two autism special classes, and um, as well, importantly, you know, two of those mainstream classes had an autism special class within the school. And, you know, typically what happens is that if there's an autism uh, special class or an autism unit, the teachers from there will help support um, the other mainstream teachers in educating students with autism. Um, as uh, looking at the overall education provision, not every single primary school in Ireland has an autism class attached to it. So I suppose my, my kind of questions were things like, you know, what happens in the majority of mainstream classes where teachers struggle to access supports and where there are no specialist teachers in the school to help them? Um, and also, you know, what were the types of practices that these teachers had variable knowledge of? Um, I suppose being a behaviour analyst, looking for the data, looking for statistics, um, and, you know, I couldn't find any measures of the types of practices they were using or the frequency um, that they were being used as well. Um, so moving on to the systematic review then. So the aim of this paper was to identify best practice in autism education. And the researchers um, in this regard conducted a systematic literature review, but also conducted a review of educational policy documents from um, a number of different countries. So the findings then from this paper were that uh, three, three interventions had most evidence for school-aged children. Uh, these were peer-mediated interventions, multi-component social skills interventions, behavioural interventions to reduce challenging behaviour, and a further five interventions had moderate evidence for school-aged children. So these were uh, social initiation training, computer-assisted emotional recognition programmes, PECs, narrative interventions such as social stories and skills teaching using behavioural approaches. Now, any of us with a background in ABA looking at this slide would say that the vast majority of these um, of these interventions, if not all of these interventions, uh, derive from behaviour analysis and come from the behavioural literature. But I suppose, again, um, you know, in the executive summary, the, the author stated the evidence provided indicates that a range of provision types and intervention strategies are needed. So again, not really um, identifying that the, the behavioural approach might be better here. Um, and they also, again, backed the, the need for a framework of autism professional development at different levels. So I suppose these were both drawn together um, into the policy advice paper. And you know, these were some of the things that were outlined in this policy advice paper then. Um, you know, they said that many teachers are now well trained in autism. It's essential that all teachers have a knowledge and understanding of students with autism. Teachers in specialist roles should um, have skills in selecting and implementing appropriate evidence-informed interventions and schools development of, inter of appropriate evidence-informed interventions should be informed by, mu by multidisciplinary uh, assessment. Um, so I suppose there were a few, a few key questions arising from po the policy advice paper um, for me. Um, again, you know, being a behaviour analyst, looking for statistics, looking for data, you know, what practices are teachers actually using? How knowledgeable are teachers of evidence-based practices? Um, are teachers receiving support from multidisciplinary teams in line with policy advice? And you know, are teachers receiving training? What types of training are they receiving? So the policy advice paper said, you know, that teachers um, are, are well trained. Many teachers are well trained, but again, the data was was lacking um, for me with that. Um, so I suppose the second strand of, of this, uh, the background to my research is, you know, why are evidence based practices for students with autism important? Um, at present, you know, you can go to the Internet, you can find information on over 1300 therapies and treatments um, for autism. So it's been described as a little bit of a fad magnet. Uh, many treatments are emotively marketed. There's claims of things like miracle cures of unlocking. So, you know, the idea of my son or daughter was locked in and now they're, they're, they're in our world, that kind of an idea. Um, but there is little scientific evidence to back up many of these claims. Um, you know, a lot of parents, a lot of teachers and other stakeholders will turn to the internet for information. Um, and when you turn to the inter internet for information and you're getting bombarded with, you know, all of these therapies and treatments that are claiming that they will cure autism and things like that, um, it can actually make it a, a little bit harder to find information on what is truly evidence based. Um, so, you know, non evidence based strategies are costly, so they can cost an awful lot of money, you know, things like 
The Sunrise program, for example, that doesn't have any scientific evidence behind it can cost um, parents an arm and a leg to attend these one week training courses. Um, they can be sometimes costly for health, you know, the, some, some children um, with different therapies like holding therapy or chelation um, therapy and things like that. Um, it can have negative health impacts and negative um, impacts in that regard. And, you know, ultimately, when you're applying non-evidence-based strategies, this is taking away um, from time that could be spent on using evidence-based practices that actually have proven efficacy as well. So there are a number of reasons why, why evidence-based practices are important. Um, when looking at identifying evidence-based practices, then uh, there are a number of different methods and reviews for evidence-based practices. But the most widely known and accepted is that from uh, the National Clearinghouse on Autism Evidence and Practice in the USA. So on the right hand side here, I just have a, a screenshot of that paper. Um, and the National, Cle National Clearinghouse has published uh, three iterations of this systematic review. The first was in 2010, second was in 2015, and the latest version, which is the one you can see here, um, was in 2020. Um, so the latest review and the 2015 review identified 27 evidence-based practices for, for students with autism. And again, uh, most of these were derived from the science of applied behaviour analysis. These evidence-based practices are here then, I'm not going to go through um, every single one of them, but um, you know, you can see in the, the ones that are bolded, these are the ones that changed in, in, the, two, in the 2020 iteration of the systematic review. So we had things like PEX was amalgamated under augmentative and alternative communication. Um, we had structured play groups was amalgamated under peer mediated instruction. And we had, you know, pivotal response training amalgamated under naturalistic interventions. But a lot of the interventions, you know, um, held the held across um, across the two reviews, such as, you know, functional behavior assessment, functional communication training, modeling, prompting, reinforcement um, and so on. So I suppose with it, while um, researchers have identified these evidence-based practices, there is a little bit of expectation versus reality going on in the autism evidence-based practice field. So I suppose the, the expectation is, you know, uh, researchers have identified evidence-based practices, they have identified that they are effective, they recommend them for use with students with autism in classrooms. Um, but I suppose that what's actually happening, um, and, and I suppose the expectation would be then that teachers adopt these evidence-based practices um, with fidelity, you know, if they're trained, they'll adopt them uh, with fidelity then. But I suppose in reality, what is happening is, you know, um, we've clearly identified that in the research that evidence-based practices are effective, teachers should use them, but, um, you know, the, the gap there is that teachers are continuing to use unsupported practices or are just not adopting evidence-based practices at all. So this is known as the research to practice gap in autism education. And I suppose where, where our research comes in as well is trying to explain this gap a little bit, you know, it's trying to understand why, why this might be happening, you know, why are teachers not um, adopting these evidence-based practices that we find efficacious in the literature. So implementation science um, is the scientific study of methods that promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice. And this is the kind of theoretical framework that we um, applied to, to our study. So we looked at the implementation stages by the National Implementation Research Network. Um, so this is under their active implementation frameworks. These are freely available on their website at the Active Implementation Hub for anybody who'd like any a little bit more information about um, these implementation models. But basically, the, the NIRN um, researchers set out that uh, implementation occurs across four kind of discrete um, and interlinked uh, stages. So the first is exploration, followed by installation, initial implementation, and then full implementation. So one of the key implementation strategies um, in the exploration stage is to assess readiness. So, you know, to assess um, baseline levels of knowledge, baseline levels of use, and to try and identify barriers and facilitators that might help or hinder teachers in adopting uh, these evidence-based practices into their classrooms. So that's kind of where our research came in then. Um, we also identified, I suppose, at the beginning of this research, some further gaps in EVP research. So a lot of the research that has been conducted um, on establishing efficacy for EBPs has been conducted in the USA. Um, you know, I think in the, the, the systematic review done by the NCSE, um, I think 65 studies were done in the USA, and I think only seven of them were conducted in Europe. 
Um, the, the research has also largely been conducted with clinicians as implementers. So there is a wealth of research out there um, with clinicians or researchers as implementers, but only 20% of the implementers of the interventions included in the latest um, Steinbrenner et al. Uh, systematic review from 2020, only 20% of these were teachers, with only 0.9% of them being uh, mainstream teachers. So there's a real gap in our understanding of teachers' adoption of these, these evidence-based practices. Um, as well as that, there's a lack of knowledge of social validity of these practices in these settings. Um, when the, there was another study conducted by Callaghan and colleagues in 2017, which looked at the evidence-based practices included in the 2015 review of VBPs, and they found that only 25%, so only a quarter of the, the researchers had actually um, included social validity as an outcome. There's a lack of stakeholder perspectives as well. So this idea of, you know, we're researchers, we're experts, um, and teachers should adopt what we tell them to adopt, rather than including stakeholders and including teachers in the, the research process and in the, de in the development of, of evidence-based practices, um, as well as that, a lack of knowledge of barriers and facilitators that are specific to autism. And as I've already kind of said, a lack of research in mainstream settings. So there was a, a large amount of research conducted in special education settings, but not a lot conducted in mainstream settings in particular. So I suppose that led to the overall research question or the overall idea of, you know, if autism EVPs have been identified, if they've been recommended for use, but there's poor uptake and implementation, then why is this happening? Um, and I suppose as well, just to have an idea, to get more of an idea of what does the autism EVP field uh, look like in Ireland? So to answer these kind of overarching questions, um, we conducted a series of studies um, so the, the first four are the empirical studies, which I want to be presenting um, to you this evening. And um, as a result of the, the results of all these, we're going to be developing a protocol, um, ideally for upscaling EVP use in Ireland. But the first study, um, what we want to do is to kind of get an overall view of the, the literature of barriers and facilitators that were specific to implementing autism EVPs in school settings. For the second study, then we wanted to gain um, some teacher perceptions of implementing autism interventions in Ireland. And then the third and fourth study, so number three and four, were informed by a survey which we distributed um, with the, the purpose of the third paper being to identify teacher characteristics such as training and support from professionals um, and baseline levels of knowledge and use of EBPs in Ireland. With the fourth study then looking at the mainstream class teachers in particular, you know, as these teachers are uh, responsible for educating 63% of the students with autism in Ireland, and as there is a general lack of understanding um, of EVP use in this area, we wanted to see, you know, did training, knowledge, attitudes and barriers uh, impact their use of EVPs then? So I'll just begin with the, what we found from the scoping review of barriers and facilitators. Um, so this paper has been published recently in Research on Autism Spectrum Disorders for any of you who might be, be interested in looking at, at it further. But our, our aim here was to identify barriers and facilitators uh, to autism EVP in implementation in school settings, like I said, and to try and draw these together to place these using a conceptual framework um, across macro school and individual level barriers and facilitators. So um, I reviewed over four and a half thousand papers uh, from our initial searches, and only seven of these actually met our inclusion criteria. So, that, you know, there was kind of very, very few papers out there on barriers and facilitators specific to autism um, and in school settings. And again, there was no studies conducted in Europe. So the barriers and facilitators that we identified then across the levels, you know, on the macro level, we had things like cultural differences, lack of access to multidisciplinary teams. Um, on a school level, we had things like lack of resources, uh, staffing issues, lack of uh, support from, from um, you know, school principals and other, other, other teachers, and lack of time. And then on the individual level, so individual to the teacher, we had you know, things like lack of training or experience, competing demands, um, student characteristics, and you know, the restrictions or that the intervention itself was difficult to implement. So I suppose this added greatly to, to our understanding of the broader literature then and, and helped us to move forward with our, our other research questions. For the qualitative study then, um, the aim was to try and gain teacher perspectives in using EVPs and potential barriers to implementation. 
Uh, so I conducted semi-structured interviews with 14 mainstream school teachers from, from five different schools. And we found, um, so I, I analyzed these using thematic analysis and we found uh, five main themes then. So the first was that teachers lack knowledge and training um, in evidence-based practices. So, you know, when I asked teachers, what is your understanding of evidence-based practices? They were coming back with things like, you know, I'm not sure is it to do with researching different teaching methods and then seeing the results and then implementing them in classrooms. Um, and I was having other teachers just simply saying, you know, I don't have a clue, I don't know. Um, with the training, then we identified that um, there were some issues with their initial teacher education, so their, their teacher preparation courses. So, you know, teachers were saying things like in six weeks, I had one lecture in SEN, I didn't have a clue. Um, teachers saying that, you know, they had to learn on the job and other issues then with accessing appropriate continuous professional development. So teachers were saying things, you know, like I signed up for a course um, in September of one year and got it in March of the following year. Um, and that, you know, the, the structure of CPD, so uh, having to go to, to summer classes, for example, wasn't really helpful then when you were back in September and you couldn't really remember what you had covered, or you might have needed a little bit more, a bit more of support in the class to, to actually be able to implement those, those things then that were recommended in those courses. Um, for sources of information, then this team dealt with um, how teachers gain access on autism and evidence-based practices. Um, and, you know, teachers reported turning to the internet um, and they also reported uh, turning to other colleagues, which was, was a real positive because I suppose there does seem to be very strong systems of collaboration in schools, which could be used as an avenue to, to try and create communities of practice around evidence-based practice. Um, so the, you know, teachers were saying things like, I don't source them based on evidence, I source them based on other people's experience and what they have used. So that idea of, you know, turning to others who have experience um, and this being a great source of information for them. With systems culture, then this team was looking at uh, the overall, I suppose, educational culture in Ireland. And we had things like, you know, the use of evidence based. It wasn't something that was highlighted for us. Evidence based practice isn't a big thing in Ireland. And, you know, uh, this idea that within schools, then, um, you know, two or three people from a school can go learn uh, strategies or learn how to implement things. And then when they come back to school, then they teach the other teachers about it. So, again, that kind of community of practice being very evident. Uh, with the curriculum resources, then this was kind of related to barriers to implementation. So teachers reported things like curriculum overload as a big issue, um, lack of time to be able to devise interventions, lack of time to be able to research them and understand them, and lack of time, I suppose, to work with the student with autism as well. And, you know, lack of resources there to support them. So teachers are saying things like, you know, they might need resources to help them implement, you know, different types of sensory um, interventions and things like that that they weren't able to access in their schools. Um, lastly, then, I suppose teacher characteristics as facilitators. This, again, was, was a facilitator in that, you know, if teachers um, had patience or, you know, if the child was having positive results from the program that they'd implemented, it, then it would make them more likely to want to implement these types of programs again in the future. So I suppose this gave us a little bit of a richer information about what was going on um, in the Irish context and definitely highlighted, you know, there isn't really a culture of evidence based practice that is apparent and teachers um, generally lacked knowledge of these practices and um, had issues accessing appropriate training as well. So looking at the, the third study, then again, the aim here was to explore teacher training, their support from professionals and their knowledge and use of evidence based practices. So this survey was completed online via Qualtrics, and I distributed this, uh, the link to the survey to all 3,105 uh, mainstream primary schools in Ireland and via social media channels as well. So um, the inclusion criteria was that the, the participant had to be a mainstream teacher with at least one year's experience teaching a student with autism. Um, and that resulted in a final sample of 369 teachers from all 26 counties in the Republic of Ireland. So these teachers answer questions related to teacher characteristics and a validated scale to measure knowledge and use of evidence-based practices, which we, we adapted from Australia. So I suppose in relation to the findings um, with teachers' access to training and support, uh, these were quite, I suppose, shocking or heart-hitting when we initially analysed the data. We found that 70% of teachers received less than three hours of uh, autism-specific initial teacher education. 78% uh, of teachers had not received any autism specific CPD before beginning to teach a student with autism 
and a third of teachers reported receiving no CPD at all. Um, and, you know, 80% of teachers also reported su receiving support from professionals less than two times per year. So I suppose what this highlighted was, you know, teachers um, seem to lack preparation and training uh, for educating students with autism. And then, you know, I suppose compounding that a little bit might be the fact that they can't access support um, from professionals as well. Uh, with regards to teachers' knowledge of practices, then um, the green bars here represent un or non evidence based or unsupported practices, and the blue indicate um, our evidence based practices. Then, so we found that teachers only had moderate knowledge of seven evidence based practices. These were visual supports, social stories, reinforcement, exercise, social skills, modeling, and uh, prompting. And then they had very little um, to little knowledge of the rest of the 20 other evidence based practices uh, that had been identified. With their use of evidence based practices, then um, we had four evidence based practices that were used sometimes. These were modeling, exercise, reinforcement, and social stories. And the rest of evidence, the evidence based practices were used rarely to never. So I suppose this. These two graphs would illustrate that you know, teachers um, had a lack of knowledge of evidence-based practices and used uh, evidence-based practices infrequently as well. So we did some um, statistical analysis of just group differences in use and knowledge of evidence-based practices. And what we found was that autism class teachers had the highest use and knowledge of evidence-based practices. Um, those with more years of experience had highest use and knowledge and teachers who had received autism CPD or more hours of um, ITE and CPD training, and those who had more access to support professionals. So those with the lowest uh, levels of use and knowledge of evidence-based practices were our mainstream class teachers, um, those with more than 21 or less than three years of experience, those with uh, no autism CPD training and less hours of training, and those with no access to support professionals as well. Uh, so this is the keyword for any of you who are collecting um, CEUs and it is case sensitive so just make sure that the I is lowercase when you're putting it into the Google form later. So for our fourth study then, um, we examined what impacts mainstream teachers use of evidence based practices. So again, um, from the previous study we identified that mainstream class teachers had the lowest levels of knowledge and use um, and you know the mainstream uh, class teachers in Ireland again are responsible for educating 63% of our students with autism now so we really wanted to see what impacts their use so that we can try and you know develop systems to to increase their capacity for using evidence-based practices um, as well. So we examined the impact of training, knowledge, attitudes and barriers um, in relation to, to EVP use um, and this was conducted with a subset of 112 mainstream class teachers. So with our mainstream teachers training, then we found that 39% uh, of them had no hours, so zero hours of ITE autism training, and 41% of them had no CPD training at all as well. So um, I suppose these, again, further illustrate the idea that our mainstream classroom teachers are, are underprepared for, for educating students with autism um, with regards to not accessing training. The barriers then to EVP use, so teachers had to, to rate barriers as um, not serious to extremely serious and the percentage of teachers rating barriers as extremely serious um, were quite high. So we had 60%, over 60% of teachers indicating that class size was an extremely serious barrier to implementing interventions. And then over 40% of them indicated that lacking training in autism Support staff such as SNAs, lacking training was another barrier, lack of time to devise interventions, lack of training in interventions, lack of time to implement and research interventions were also rated by extremely serious by over 40% um, of the teachers in that sample. So I suppose what this highlights is that teachers, you know, experience quite a number of extremely serious barriers in trying to implement uh, interventions with students with autism. Uh, for the knowledge and use of evidence-based practices in this sample, then we had only a moderate extent of knowledge of five EVPs, so visual supports, social stories, reinforcement, uh, social skills, interventions and exercise, and they only sometimes used uh, three uh, evidence-based practices, which were social stories, exercise and reinforcement. So I suppose uh, comparatively with the larger sample, they, they had less knowledge and less use of, of evidence-based practices as well. Uh, so we statistically analysed um, associations between uh, these different factors and use of evidence-based practices. 
And what we found was that knowledge of evidence-based practices was strongly associated with use. Uh, so the higher the levels of knowledge, the, the more frequently teachers used evidence-based practices. Uh, some of our training measures, so teachers' ratings of their initial teacher education and CPD training in autism was associated, um, so higher ratings. Uh, higher satisfaction was associated with higher levels of use of evidence-based practices um, and higher number of hours of CPG were also associated with higher use of evidence-based practices as well. Um, so we examined some attitudes to evidence-based practices as well and, and openness to using evidence-based practices. So I suppose the teachers' open attitudes uh, to trying something new and trying um, interventions was associated with higher levels of use of evidence-based practices again and the appeal of the evidence-based practice so you know if it would be easy to implement or um you know the, the general appeal of it was associated again with higher um, use of evidence-based practices interestingly even though teachers um rated a lot of those uh, barriers from the previous slide as extremely serious there was no association found between any of those barriers and use of evidence-based practices which is kind of something we weren't really um expecting so we went and did a few further kind of sensitivity analyses then <clears throat> and what we found was that the key predictor of evidence-based practice use in this sample was knowledge. Um, so I suppose looking at you know the broader literature they do I suppose advocate for the idea of these barriers impeding or affecting uh, use of evidence-based practices uh, but the only one that held true for ours really was, was knowledge. So I suppose the, the potential mechanism that we're theorizing um, might be underlying is that um, our sample had such low levels of knowledge that maybe, you know, as knowledge increases, then other barriers become more salient. So maybe, um, you know, in other samples where knowledge was higher, this is why other barriers were, were salient at the time. And this is why they were associated with EBP use, but not in ours. So I suppose the potential mechanism that we're looking at there is, you know, increasing knowledge, um, of being able to identify and address other barriers then, which might then lead to increased use of evidence-based practices in general. <clears throat> so I suppose just, just trying to bring it all together. Um, it appears that teachers in Ireland in particular are mainstream teachers lack knowledge of evidence-based practices and, you know, they appear to use them infrequently. Uh, this could again potentially be down to the fact that teachers um, lack support from professionals. There's a lack of support professionals available to teachers and they, they seem to access those infrequently as well. Um, and, you know, there seems to be a few significant issues with training as well. So teacher preparation um, in initial teacher education courses and also accessing timely appropriate um, CPG as well. So I suppose this might impact in a number of different ways, but research in Ireland has shown that, you know, teachers lack confidence and are apprehensive educating students with autism. Teachers lack confidence planning for special educational needs and teachers need uh, support selecting strategies. So, you know, maybe um, increasing knowledge and use of evidence based practices might be a way to overcome these issues with self efficacy and confidence um, and improve teachers, you know, ability to educate students with autism as well. And I suppose for our students with autism then, you know, there, there are, I suppose, a few negative outcomes. Um, now, there doesn't seem to be any specific measure of student outcomes um, available, not that I could find anyway. But uh, previous research has shown that t uh, students with autism experience significant rates of school exclusions. Um, there are some issues with them accessing the, the Irish primary school curriculum. And um, other research has shown that, you know, a large number of students that are included in a mainstream primary school then actually transfer on to a secondary special school. Um, and, you know, teach it the, the, I suppose, reasons around these, again, remain unknown. But, you know, there probably is um, a case there to be made for, you know, if we used more evidence based practices and if teachers were, were able to use these and had the training and support to use them, that maybe some of these negative outcomes might be um, might be changed. Um, so the implications then for, for I suppose, the overall field, in, you know, in terms of the policy and things like that, are that there see, seem to be a few different gaps between um, autism education policy and, you know, what is actually happening um, on the ground. Uh, so there have been calls, you know, since that NCSE paper um, in 2016, 2015, 2016, um, for you know appropriate systems of CPD and training to be made available to teachers um, but as of yet I can't see that that's happened and you know our research is reflective of only a year ago and we're finding large numbers of teachers that haven't been able to access CPD um, 
so you know there there is definitely a real need for that policy advice and guidance to be implemented um, as soon as possible. Um, I think as well, you know, the, the Department of Education obviously hinted at, you know, evidence informed interventions should be considered by teachers. The policy advice paper outlines, you know, that evidence based practices um, could be used with students with autism in these settings. Uh, but as of yet, there doesn't seem to be any kind of comprehensive CPD framework for training teachers in these practices or, um, you know, a policy focus on using evidence based practices with students with autism. Now, again, this could be back to the underlying kind of philosophical differences between uh, behavioural interventions and uh, constructivism and eclecticism and stuff. But there are uh, calls out there, I suppose, for, you know, um, what's known as technical eclecticism. So allowing teachers to choose um, from a, an intervention toolbox, but making sure that these uh, interventions within that toolbox are evidence based. Um, as well as that, I suppose there, there is a strong need probably to evaluate outcomes for students um, with autism again. So, you know, is the current model of inclusive education working? Um, and, you know, if we implement evidence based practices, is that going to have any effect as well? As a behaviour analyst, I suppose, you know, one of the, the key take home messages for me was um, being aware of the, the lack of knowledge and lack of use of evidence based practices in schools, you know, as a lot of us are going in providing consultations and things like that, I think that's very good to be aware of. Um, and within, you know, our own bank of, of training, um, I think definitely trying to employ effective training practices such as behavioural skills training when recommending interventions for use in schools would be very helpful. Um, and as well, concentrating on things like modeling, you know, showing teachers how, how these interventions work, showing them how to do it, and providing support for implementation as well. So, you know, one of the, the things in implementation science is this idea of ongoing support for implementation, ongoing adaptation needed. Um, so, you know, I, I know definitely from my own experience that, you know, I was hired a lot by parents to go into schools to provide recommendations. So, you know, there is maybe the need to make parents aware from the outset that you might need to provide continuous support in that setting rather than just... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so with the, the policy gaps identified then, you know, I definitely think that us as behaviour analysts with our knowledge of the area, with our knowledge of evidence based practices um, and, you know, that idea of effective training practices that we are perfectly positioned to provide guidance in this area. Um, so, you know, maybe coming together and trying to, to get um, a group together uh, might be useful as well. And, you know, as researchers as well, what can we do? I think there's definitely um, a need for further research in mainstream settings in particular. I think it's going to be very difficult to bridge that research to practice gap until evidence-based practice research starts being conducted in the settings where um, we ultimately want them to end up. And, you know, there is this idea in implementation science of hybrid implementation models, whereby researchers conduct feasibility and efficacy studies in tandem. Um, and this helps, you know, identify contextual issues. So ad adaptations that might need to be made to training practices or to evidence based practices uh, to support implementation. And it's just supporting this idea of moving away, you know, from our typical kind of pilot test, small group test and then larger implementation type of research. Um, and as well, you know, we need definitely further investigation of evidence based practices in Europe in general, but also um, barriers and facilitators and how these might impact in school settings too. So I suppose the next step then um, for, for me with all this is, you know, we're conducting a few further analyses on the data. It's a huge data set and I currently have uh, two undergraduate students who are helping me conduct, uh, to, to get through a little bit more of this. Um, you know, we're developing that protocol for upscaling evidence-based practice use, so it would be great um, to try and, you know, uh, forward that um, and, and get some more funding and stuff for, for actually implementing this in, in, in schools. Um, and, you know, as well, I'm very interested in building networks and collaboration. Um, so if any of you who are, are interested in, you know, trying to develop a little bit of a, a network for, for increasing evidence-based practice use in primary schools in Ireland, uh, please do contact me. Um, and, you know, just for anybody who's interested in reading any further, I have uh, written a few blogs for, for our iTeach website. Um, these are the three of the papers that I discussed um, tonight as well for any of you who want to do further reading. The, the scoping review is, is available open access and the papers three and four are available as preprints print, at um, advanced preprints as well. 
And these are just some references as well for any of you who want to read any further. So hopefully, I think I finished up with, yeah, 10 minutes to go. Um, so it'd be great to open it up to questions now. And look, if any of you are interested in collaborating any further, discussing anything um, outside of this evening, there is my email address, my Twitter handle, um, and the, the iTeach website as well, if any of you want to get in touch. So thanks a million for your attention, everyone. It was uh, absolutely great to, to be able to present that to you. Wow. Thank you so much, Lorna. That was very so insightful. And just from a personal point of view, you know, going into schools, having that background and understanding of where teachers are coming from is, to me at least, invaluable. I'm going to go through some of the questions. Feel free to keep them coming in on the chat. So we've got some thank yous coming in already, Lorna. So um, I'm just going to read it out here. So in relation to the barriers you identified in your scoping review, is there a problem in identifying the context for requiring EVPs? Example, do you need to determine the idiosyncratic and very specific needs of a child or a young person to determine what is necessary to address those needs? Is there a foundation of skills necessary prior to identifying and selecting any EVPs? Okay, so that's a that's a long one. I'll just open that up so I yeah. can try to read it you read it yourself. It might be easier. Yeah. <laughs> I'm um, kind of trying to to get my head around that one. Okay, uh, is there a problem in identifying the context for requiring evidence based practices? Um, is there a foundation of skills necessary prior to identifying and selecting EVPs? I definitely think, you know, our research in paper four probably identified, you know, that there is definitely a foundation of skills that are necessary um, in order for teachers to be able to identify and, and select evidence-based practices. So knowledge was the key predictor um, for use. So I definitely think that that um, is necessary. And then, you know, with the, the context as well, I definitely think there is a need within the context. Um, so sorry, is there a problem in identifying the context for requiring evidence based practices? I think that's kind of reflective of the overall research in that the context in which um, evidence based practice research has taken place has typically been in one to one or small group settings. Um, and therefore, you know, when you're trying to implement these things in larger group settings, such as mainstream classes, um, you know, there is a need definitely to identify are these evidence based practices um, working in these settings and what kind of adaptations need to be need to be made um and yeah identifying the the needs of a child and young person um would also be i suppose part and parcel of trying to upskill teachers in in their knowledge of it as well um i hope that's answering the question i think that's it, that i might be maybe going off on a different tangent but i hope that that is is kind of answering that question and the second part there do you see a role for accountability in what is being implemented as practices um so accountability there with you know there being a requirement for teachers to use practices i think definitely there needs to be um some kind of formalized um set of of guidelines for teachers on what practices to use and what are evidence-based because i think teachers generally aren't aware um in our context of, of these practices in the first place and um you know i think that that's probably what the protocol that we're developing is going to try and, and address in a sense is, you know, maybe um, developing a tool bank, because I suppose one of the, the other issues that I identified uh, looking at all this stuff and, you know, delving into this, you know, is our evidence-based practices actually evidence-based in these, in these settings just due to the lack of research, but there have, have been a few meta-analyses and systematic reviews um, published since on EVPs in those settings in particular. So I think definitely, um, there they there needs to be some kind of more formal guidance um again i'm very sorry if that's on here it's kind of hard to to, to gain a, a correct understanding of, of of what you mean um from it being written but thanks a million for the question anyway definitely it was very in-depth um we have another one here just did you include snas in the analysis no we didn't know so i suppose the, the thinking behind that obviously i think snas have a, a huge role um to play in the education of students with autism in ireland but i suppose just going back to the des guidance um in that mainstream class teachers are responsible for educating students with sen in their classes that's kind of why we we went with the mainstream uh teachers in particular in the mainstream schools 
Perfect. Um, there's another question here. Can I ask if you've delivered this to the NCSE or other teacher training bodies? Not yet. No, that's kind of <laughs> hopefully the next step, the, the next steps of um, of trying to get this out um, to, to the wider body. I suppose that's why, you know, uh, giving a talk like this this evening is great and trying to get maybe um, some collaboration and, and some people behind, um, you know, this area in general. And again, I think just, you know, getting even the statistics behind it um, in, I suppose, contrast to the policy advice papers and things like that, that we're using very vague um, terms, you know, teachers had, um, many teachers had training, um, you know, no, no indication there again of the quality of training or, or the impact that that might be having or the statistics behind it. So I think even gathering that kind of information should hopefully be useful. Um, to, to, I suppose, uh, being bringing this to the NCSE and other teacher training bodies as well, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have another question here. Do you, did you consider modes of CBT, CBT, CPD when considering implementation? Um, not yet, no. I mean, we have data collected on the different types of CPD that teachers received. Um, so there is some further analysis going to be conducted on that. Um, but I suppose the broader implementation science research would suggest that, you know, the idea of workshops and things like that are largely ineffective unless you're following up with in-person support for implementation. Um, so I think that definitely will be informing, again, that protocol that we're, we're hoping to develop um, to effective, effectively change that, um, you know, and, and provide that kind of in-person support then as well. Brilliant. Uh, there's lots of thank yous coming in and lots of people saying that was really interesting and valuable. Um, I'm just trying to filter through and see if there was any other specific questions. Just someone saying that they might email you in relation to the networking side of things, which I think you're saying, yes, please come. Yes, please, yeah, definitely. Email yeah. me, email me, email me. Yeah. Yeah. Did anybody want to jump on on the microphone and ask anything? Because we still have a few minutes left if anybody wants. Yeah, um, I don't know if you can hear me. It's Camilla, Camilla Marks here. Um, hi, Lorna. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Thank very you, Camilla. Fantastic presentation. Um, I actually have loads more questions for you, so I don't want to hog this space for that. So I might touch base with you at another time. Yeah. I asked a question with regards to the mode of CPD because my uh, kind of understanding in this space is that like we we often think that delivering knowledge is a sufficient piece of of cpd delivery when as you've said yourself there needs to be a, a pathway that surpasses that i.e you know follow on cluster support communities of practice the on-site coaching and modeling piece and i just wondered had you any thoughts about further research into um into the effectiveness of different modes of CPD to support the implementation side of things. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose there has been a good amount of research conducted in the broader implementation science field, you know, on that idea of what constitutes effective training and what actually leads yeah. to, to the sustained implementation. And to be honest, it is so massive. It's very actually hard to get your head around because you have you know, the bottom up and top down approach, you have things like your policies guiding what um, CPD is available and your policies guiding, you know, what philosophical approaches are taken in schools. And then that filters down, you know, to the school level. Um, and within the schools, then you have things like the, the leadership from um, the SEN team or from the, the school principal. And I suppose that's another thing in um, Ireland, you know, there isn't really a, a stratified, I suppose, system of support for students or no, for teachers in schools, you know, in the USA, you typically have, you know, an SEN coordinator who's responsible for developing programs and special education teachers responsible for IEPs. But here it just seems um, kind of very disjointed. Um, yeah. And then, you know, within that, then you have your effective training and then you have your ongoing support. So it's actually, you know, it's, it's very broad and um, it's definitely, you know, I am trying to develop a multi-phase um, I suppose system that kind of addresses all of those different needs um, as well. But yeah, the, the different modes of, of CPD in particular, you know, I think delivering uh, knowledge based workshops is great, but you have to kind of be following that up with some yeah. kind of on site support, because, again, you know, and that's something that that was said in the, the interviews that I, I conducted with teachers, they're going on whole day training courses. 
Um, mm. They're learning about these things, but then when they go to the classroom the following day to try and implement it with 25 or 30 other students, mm. it's, it's very difficult for them then. So, you know, yeah. um, it'll definitely be really interesting trying to delve a little bit further into that. And, you know, hopefully, I mean, I think I've probably created nearly another PhD for myself with all of the, <laughs> all the stuff that I found and all the ideas that I have. <laughs> or even the, the PhD in like what are teachers understandings of what evidence-based practice is you know what is evidence and there's another issue like yeah, exactly. how are you actually determining what you mean by evidence what is the category of data you're talking about and then I think looking at um for teachers per se is that it's not so much just taking a take a practice and slap it on you know figure that out within a process of the students that you're uh, working with within yeah. an overall objective you know and I think I think then you might have three more PhDs there. Yeah, now. definitely. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of that, yeah. It's that stage of the the PhD where I nearly have more questions than I've answered now. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, <laughs> it's a really, really, really thought provoking and very comprehensive. Um, so congratulations on it. Thank, Thank you very much. Me. And yeah, definitely feel free to to touch base as well yeah. if you want to discuss any of that stuff further. If you want to try and um, you know, get to the bottom of a few other things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank you, Lorna. Thanks, Minion. Lorna, if you have time for one more question, we've just yeah. more come in. It's a little long, so it might be easier if you read it yourself, just only from a understanding it. Yeah, I can see it there. Um, did you, oh, sorry, I'm actually taking out of that now. Um, did you notice any impact of having buy-in from staff in leadership positions and does the implementation buy-in need to be there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the broader implementation science net, um, framework would definitely suggest that you, you need, um, leadership positions and you need staff in those leadership positions to be kind of pushing for those evidence-based practices to be used. Um, and, you know, within our research as well, we did find some evidence from the, uh, from one of the schools in particular, um, they had very strong systems of leadership. So that, that was the qualitative interviews that I conducted um, whereby the, sorry, I'm actually just going to stop sharing my screen here because I'm getting confused between all the different things. Um, so we did notice with one of the, the schools um, that we we interviewed that there were teachers there reporting things like, you know, the, the principal taking leadership. So the principal was finding pieces of research, feeding these down to the staff, getting the staff to read them. And then, you know, a staff member would read it and present it to all of the other staff members and they would discuss whether or not that was something that they would um, implement then, you know, as a, as a, as a cohort. Um, so I definitely think that there is um you know that that staff in leadership positions definitely have some kind of an impact on implementation as well but i suppose that just wasn't something that we studied in in more detail then in our further analyses but you know something i suppose when we're looking at the broader scale up of these practices um with things like our protocol definitely that leadership buy-in is is hugely important as well yeah brilliant thank you so much again lorna like you can see from the chat that they're everybody found it really 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 valuable um and i suppose just to say in general if there are other people out there who have interesting topics that they want to discuss don't hesitate to contact the monster behavior analyst forum we welcome um you know collaboration from the community at large so um anybody who wants to get in touch feel free to it's great for us to be able to get together as a community and you know, um, I suppose, share our knowledge with each other. So thank you so much again, Lorna, for your time this evening. Um, and um, thanks everybody for coming and for your engagement and everything. And we'll leave it there. Great, thanks for being